Good evening. Good evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Maurice Willis, and I have the pleasure of starting an introduction of a night with the Louisiana Poet Laureate, featuring John Warner Smith. Now, before we bring up our featured guest, I would like to have an introduction of a featured singer, Dr. Valerie Francis. A distinguished vocal artistry combined with superior music preparation defines the American mastery of Dr. Valerie Francis, recitalist, opera singer, music professor, and scholar. Her award-winning, brilliant voice places her among the country's greatest performers of classical music and Negro spirituals. Dr. Francis currently serves as an associate professor of music and an executive artistic director of opera and vocal programming at Nichols State University. Associate Professor Francis serves in several capacities here at Nichols State University, namely vocal music educator, full voice studio, executive artistic director, founder of opera programs, and a celebration of the Negro Spiritual Concert Series. Director of Nickel State Gospel Choir, appointed member of African American Program Committee and Music Department Recruitment Initiative. In 2017, she appeared at the ordination of Reverend Dr. William B.G.K. Harris as the first Bishop of International Christian Fellowship, Atlanta, Georgia, receiving another of her standing ovations. Then on the Harry Show on national television with her daughter, receiving a standing ovation and compliments from host Harry Cornett Jr. It is my pleasure to present to you, Dr. Valerie Francis. I will now sing a Negro spiritual or a lament entitled Lord, How Come We Here, arranged by Evelyn Currington Simpson.
Dr. Francis for that beautiful, heartfelt, soulful sharing of your heart. Nickel State is blessed to have you. There's an African term from the Aiken tribe in West Africa. It's called Sankofa. And it means to go back and get it. And that it's not taboo to go back and get what you've either forgotten, didn't know, or overlooked. Sankofa. That's what we're doing here tonight as we go back and hear stories through songs and poetry. And I'm honored to share the stage with such beautiful souls like John Warner Smith. It's a privilege. John Warner Smith appointed Louisiana's newest poet laureate by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities and Governor John Bell Edwards began his two-year term on August 14, 2019. Smith is the former Secretary of Labor for then Governor Kathleen Babineau Blanco. He now teaches English at Southern University in Baton Rouge, in addition to regularly publishing poetry. He is making history today as the first African-American male appointed as Louisiana's poet laureate. Edwards said in a prepared statement, John Warner Smith's writing captures the human experience through meaningful, passionate poetry that moves your emotions. John is not only talented, a talented and gifted poet, he is a trailblazer who devotes himself to the education and the greater good of the community. Smith has published four has four published collections of poetry, Muhammad's Mountains, Spirit of the Gods, Soul Be a, a Witness, and, and a, Mandela, a Mandela of Hands. His fifth collection, Our Shut Eyes, New and Selected Poems on Race, on Race in America, uh, is forthcoming this year from Mad Hat Press. Now, uh, Mr. John Warner Smith is very humble, and he told me that he doesn't like longer bios, but I'll continue because it's amazing. <laughs> Smith's poems have appeared in numerous literary journals across the country, including Plowshares, Callaloo, North American Review, and Missouri Review. And he is the winner of the 2019 Linda Hodge Brown Board, Brown Bird Poetry Award. Much of his poetry draws upon African American history and his personal experiences, and his personal experience, experiences of growing up and living in the South. As Louisiana's literary ambassador for the next two years, Smith will travel the state encouraging fellow Louisianans to explore and engage with poetry. So thank you for being here as we are sample. May I present to you Poet Laureate of Louisiana, Mr. John Warner Smith. Thank you, thank you all for being here this evening um, to hear some poetry and what a beautiful song. Uh, I, I was just sitting there saying, man, I should have had to pay to hear that, you know, and I got it for <laughs> the and Dr. Francis. Um, I'm going to begin, let me ask you if you would, in the interest of uh, just uh, us getting through uh, the next 45 minutes without uh, interruption, just hold the pause until it's all done. Um, not that you would have brought <laughs> Letter to the Oaks. Uh, these first two poems, by the way, are from A Mandela of Hands, my first collection. And this poem is in two parts. Part one, Charleston, 1863. Letter to the Oaks. Long before, Frost kissed the shoulder, the 
for geese foretold a miracle of raindrops congealed on the mud pond. You were the envy of maple. In autumn, you were ginkgo beneath azure crisp and glazing. Your fan petals fell ripe in winter with arms spread like sails of the last slave ship pushing off the coast of Gambia. What bled and drowned <clears throat> in the light of those parched moons when they packed humans in the vile stench of a hole can never be redeemed, never, in your sweet shade of, or under your crown of innocence, when placenta dries in a cotton field and horse hoofs clock on a hangman's road. Two, Birmingham. 1963. You were just a seedling, tall and slender in girth, when you gave sanctuary to newborn sparrows who flew the geese flight. The breath wind of slaves seared your mama's bars, sent cries soaring moonward over black waves along the coast of Senegal. And then the cataclysm. Cannons ripped your green swaying lots and rained leaves blood soaked across two fields staking their claim to your roots. If there is truth, if there is time for truth, it is not. When you grow old, hearing beacon shrills at dawn, waking birth of big dreams, and you stand the shifts of seas, mountains, and human conscience. Gazing, this poem is uh, this one in which I'm speaking to my father. One keen holiday, I will you to the nursing home patio, drifting in and out of your blank stare. I read Trethaway's Southern History, recalling the year at Rossi Junior High, when Ms. Trotman, the civics teacher, said Hoover was right to call King a communist. That was a lie, I knew, but enough to make Hugh Martin and his pals hate more. That year, the one before King's death, a bad spine kept you home for weeks. On those mornings, I rose early to cook two eggs for you over easy, keeping the flame low and blue enough Beneath the old black skin, I dragged the spatula slowly to gather the frothing butter, careful not to break the yolk, nor harden the white, the thin white. Across town, mama's polished corn slit shoes and air dried nylon dress had already stained with grease from Mr. Woody's hot oven drawer. Daddy, gazing into your eyes, the long leaf swaying as the sun's yoke peeked through gray clouds behind you. I wondered if I ever really, if I ever really know the bird you bore a black man living in the South. The second collection, uh, So Be a Witness, uh, is, is actually uh, subtitled Songs to Boys of Color. So I'll, I'll read maybe uh, three poems from this collection, and uh, <coughs> I 
think I have long been dedicated to crying young men of that, yes, of that organization. Are they here, you see? So, maybe, maybe a couple of dedicated to you. Um, this book was, uh, to tell the story, it was inspired by a letter I received from my son. Patrick, my only son, I have two daughters and eight grandsons. So I know a little bit about boys. <laughs> and two granddaughters. By the way, my wife Norma, sitting right here, responsible for all of that. <laughs> um, and so the book is, um, I received this letter from Patrick uh, via the email on Father's Day, sitting in an airport. And struggle with how to respond to it. The book is my response. Uh, let's begin with mentor. Hmm? For a young man in the crowd. Or, and it's, uh, it's dedicated to uh, Herb Fontenot, who's, uh, I guess you might say, was my very first mentor as a young boy. When the fires and lands had gone out, and he learned that three of us, all tenderfoots, had been heard talking about girls in a nasty, subtle way. He entered our tent, scolded us, and gave a lesson on how babies are made. When we couldn't get to scout meetings because we lived 10 miles away, he bought the tin can an old school bus that drove as badly as it looked. But the radio worked just fine. When we competed in our first swim meet, he recruited three lifeguards from the city pool across the river to join our troop. We took the top ribbons, but never saw those boys again. When we needed a theme for the jamboree, he made us become scouts around the world, dressed like photographs we had cut out of National Geographic. Again, we took the rivers home. When we needed an entry for the cake-off, he had the school cooks to bake a globe cake three feet high. <laughs> we frosted it with shapes of all the continents oceans and seas, and we took the top trophy. When we got the invitation to march in our first parade, he made us rehearse for days, singing patriotic songs, our strides in perfect step. We stood tall as giants as we passed the wave of crowds. When another troop <laughs> at summer camp instigated a fight and ganged up on two of our scouts. He planned a pre-dawn raid on the troops' campsite. Quieter than crickets, we crept through the black fog, deep into the electric woods, and lay in the tall grass. When he gave the command, we charged, running like hyenas, knocking down every tent pitched. When a scout broke a rule, he made him run a belt line, a tunnel of hard-hitting licks, 50 boys to a side. Sixth graders got double, his fan belt. Every lash on the palm like the sting of a thousand bees. Some boys jerked and jitterbugged, others stood proudly like statues, but he didn't stop swinging until he saw tears. When he got really angry with us, the blood vessels in his temples swelled and his lower jaw twitched. We could feel his teeth gritting, but he spoke with his eyes. When our fathers weren't there, he was.
So I gave you mom, I gave you daddy his uh, mama poem. My mama poem. It's called titled Higher Ground, Higher Ground. There was never enough water for those hot summer days when I was all flesh and feeling acne, shyness, a tweedy bird voice, lumps in my nipples that looked like little breasts. I gladly did the indoor chores, but pinning her sheets, bras, and panties on the clothesline in the bare light of day had become far too girly for the boy who had grown to hate the face that he feared the world had been watching. I needed freedom and space. Maybe that's what I was feeling when I told Mama, I ain't doing that no more. I'm a man now. She knew the storm had arrived. A war had been declared, but it took me years to realize I was drowning, burning. She was standing on higher ground. Okay, young men, this, uh, this is for you, and it's called You. I write long poems, unfortunately. And the good thing is that I, I, I revise and revise and revise, and I love long poems. The bad thing is that I have to read them. You know, so <laughs> you, you. <clears throat> I once read a tale of a carpenter who saw an oak and said to it, you are useless because you are old. You never bear fruit and your wood could never be used to build anything. Well, that evening as the carpenter slept, the oak appeared to him in a dream. Why, the oak asked, do you compare me to trees that are pilfered and broken and die young? You poor marble. Well, I have become so old and great if I had been useful in any way. There comes a time in your journey when great clouds begin to gather. The view ahead looks hazy, then dark. But the road is familiar, marked, and filled with the world of travelers. You feel an urge to turn, take a different path, abandon the known, and let go of the ground below. But you doubt, you fear not knowing where the path will take you, why it tugs like a rock in your gut. So you stay the familiar course, hoping it fulfills your needs or leads to some purpose. Again and again, you feel the road bending inside you. Still, you resist the turn. Restless, confused, but assured by the company of many others, you look back and straight ahead. Finally, on the darkest night, you yield to the haunting whisper that only you can hear. And you turn alone. Soon the path is a whirling sea filled with peril. You stumble, fall, feel lost, hurt, and betrayed by faith. Still, you press on into the blindness and shivering sounds of night, ignoring the trumpeting voices, the, the hands that pull and hold. You press on, falling and getting up, doubting and believing until one day, Decades.
days later, perhaps the window of heaven opens, opens. and a person inside you appears. A man. A man with more strength and peace than you could have dreamt or imagined. You had lived to be your great purpose. So, Collection 3 is a unique book in that it's a collection of both poetry and art. And I must always mention my partner in this project, uh, Dennis Paul Williams, a very talented uh, artist who lives in St. Martin and plays uh, guitar in his brother Zadiko band, Nathan Zadiko Cha Cha. Anyone ever heard Nathan? Okay. Well, if you ever get an opportunity, please uh, uh, stop in at this uh, gallery in St. Martin for Or better yet, buy the book. It's great art. <laughs> so, uh, then it's uh, in the summer and fall of uh, 2016, uh, we started this project. And it, it went on for about six months, I don't know, he would text me pictures. He would take the art and I would write, write poems inspired by it. So here are a few poems. And it really is fantastic art. If you care nothing about the Lord, you know, the art is just, it's worth, it's worth buying. Uh, a cup of, a uh, combination of both real and, and I guess, imaginary Here's one of the imagined uh, characters, but uh, still real in many ways. In the story that is told of her, at least. <clears throat> and so this character is Hannah. And I'll read two poems about Hannah. First is Silhouette. My cousin Hannah sleeps in the dungeon of a castle with men whose hands and words make her sing with her mouth closed. Others make her mop their music and sear their names into her flesh. She doesn't feel the pincers pulling, pecking on her brokenness. Her mother thinks it Began when Hannah started lighting candles, rooms full of them. On the day her magic mirror shattered in a prayer, she sang morning to morning, as if she weren't a flower blooming only in the night, petaled on street corners, as if she weren't a bird feeding on wild mushrooms while her babies were dying of starvation. With him, the portrait and silhouette do the post. Her makeup doesn't wash off. It's the shadow of her soul that breathes, walks, the atoms, sells the body to gain the world. Second poem is Hannah's Epiphany. She doesn't see them anymore. Her crimson petals wilting, the masquerading personas, all the faces appearing in the mirrors, and outwardly, the world indifferent to her pain. Indifferent to her pain. All she sees now is that crystal night she once dreamt when she gathered her beauty and cheerfulness, folded them into the hem of her dress, jumped off a steep cliff, and went tumbling, careening into the abyss. She can't see or hear what lies beneath or ahead. Ocean, round, dark, deep ravine, Sunday sermons echoing, but she knows she must go there. I think I'll get grounded and 
more imagination. Well, let me go with this one first. It's a poem um, titled Initiation Five teenage black boys meander a lot, riding rusted out grown bicycles with parts missing and mismatched. Like a mirage on a rolling asphalt road, summer days glisten ahead of them. The boys will play, wander for hours with no destination or, or sense of time except when their bodies grow tired, thirsty, or hungry, or from the clouds, the silent, unfamiliar voices call. God only knows how the boys will answer. But to become men, they will leave home, go alone, down dark, untrodden paths, leave, learn virtue, and suffer pains of growth, like circumcision, part of them dying until their crimes make rivers of new life. Then his last poem from this collection is uh, one I had a lot of fun with. Uh, it's, uh, it's called Imagining for John Lennon, for John Lennon and Tracy K. Smith. Now, uh, some of you are old enough to know John Lennon, who he was. Uh, and in the literary world, Tracy K. Smith is a really beautiful, talented uh, poet, and was uh, most recently the poet laureate of, of, of the United States. Um, Why well, I put them together in this poem, I uh, just kind of felt it, you know, imagine. What if Earth? were turned upside down. Land, beasts, fish and fowl, rivers, seas and mountains, high above. Sky, galaxies, clouds and rainbows down below. And humans standing, sitting, lying down outdoors with nothing to look up to. Where would birds go? Would there be airplanes and jet bombers, astronomy, trips to outer space? Could we predict climate and weather? Would we jog, walk, play, fire up a pit in the park? <laughs> Would race and walls divide us? Would there be baseball, parades? Would we need plumbing? Would there be television, internet, and smartphones? Could we buy our favorite anything like latte, pastries, and music? Would wealth and privilege rule? Would we build skyscrapers? Would we believe in God? Eternity? For certain, there would be countries, religion, and war. There would be death, poverty. Umbilical cords and roots, language tearing down and building up. For certain, we would take and destroy. We would seek and knock, open locked doors and fill empty rooms. We would be doing and dreaming, gathering and building priceless possessions, like mirrors and lenses to gaze into windows to gaze out. The last collection, most recent collection published is Muhammad's The Mountain, um, 42 poems written um, about Muhammad Ali, the great, the greatest, <laughs> the greatest boxer of all time and a truly beautiful human being and ambassador for peace and for Parkinson and uh, of course known as much for his, his uh, standing up for, for truth and for what he felt was right as much as
because he's known for boxing. So, uh, how am I doing on time? What's there? Great. I'm good? Let me know because I, well, I can tell you how to get, I get wound up, man, and you got to pull me off the stage. Okay. <laughs> Last bill. Last bill. Marciano was right. You had the fever and couldn't quit until you were beaten. The fever had you. Time and fire tested your iron ribcage and jaw. But head blows took a toll. The butterfly and bee lost their wings. The hummingbird lost its speed and mid-flight wizardry. To dark start levitate and back up quicker than a blade. Speaks, Holmes, and Burbick were the last bell. Three times heavyweight champ. The killer syndrome started its march, and the mountain climbed again. That poem, uh, I, I, of course, uh, passed over a lot of poems that recounts all these experiences. His legal battles, his experience in fighting the U.S. government for what he felt was right, but uh, um, in the interest of time, I had to kind of pass over that. The last poem I just read uh, is the last poem of, this, of, of, of a section, uh, of that section uh, in which Ali was, uh, was approaching the end of his, uh, his, his, his fighting career and was beginning a new fight um, against Parkinson's. This is in uh, this section, Seeking God. Uh, he went on this quest, uh, spiritual journey to find God. And I think he did. Um, so, a few poems about that. Uh, he was very much, uh, as a Muslim, you know, a friend of the Muslim world. Into Africa, in fact, fought one of the greatest fights in, in Africa. And this one is uh, it's called Sun of Africa. Uh, begins with uh, a part of a poem titled Heritage by Conti Cullen, the great Hall of Renaissance poet Conti Cullen. What is Africa to me? Proper sun, a scarlet sea, jungle store, a jungle track. Strong bronzed men or regal black women from whose lawns I sprang when the birds of Eden sang. It's a question. What is Africa to me? Son of Africa, brave, beautiful, gifted Ali, deserving of the crown you wear and the praise that cloaks you, like the lushness of our greenest fields, your conviction to truth. Justice stirred the gods of our dreams. Years ago, our men, women, and children lined the streets, roofs, and treetops to see the young American champion who dared to call himself African and Muslim, and who let the glow of his rays turn the eyes of the world toward the beauty and greatness of our beloved continent. In our eyes, you are one of us, cradled and fed by our bosom. Even now, we sing and dance to your drum, a song of freedom and resistance to war that rings through the fire of your fervent, silent prayers. What you said of Mandela, can I say of you? A man whose heart, soul, and spirit could not be contained or restrained by racial and economic injustices, metal bars, or the burden of hate and revenge. Uh, one more from this collection. Maybe I should give you a fight poem. What do you think? Those are my favorite. Uh, I had planned for that. But. Now here's, uh, it's, it's a poem I've never read publicly, but uh, 
there was a fight. There was not a fight. Okay, this computerized fight um, between Ali and Rocky Marciano. But there was just one guy, in my mind at least, uh, from Texas who thought it was a real fight. <laughs> Super fight. Let me tell you, boy, I was there. Not in person, but I saw that fight. No build up, no ringside crowd, just Marciano and Clay. The only two undefeated heavyweight champs. I remember that night like yesterday, January 20th, 1970. Snowed all day. And Grandma and I had to push the pickup to get it going. Marciano whipped Clay's butt. Plain and simple. Knocked him out in the 13th round. Next day, Clay, Clay came out and called fate. Said the fight was some kind of computer made it out of town. Said he and Rocky only spared as far as a few rounds and the computer did the rest. Said he only did it because he needed the money. Boom. Boom. The fight was real. And Clay got a real ass with it. Rocky beat him to a pulp. People say Clay was soft, slow, because he hadn't fought for a couple of years. Looked pretty fit to me. Clay was what? 27? Marciano was 45. 45 years old. He had trimmed down quite a bit. And it looked like he had a toupee, but <laughs> Clay couldn't hit it hard enough to knock it off. Clay was what, 6'3", the tallest man Marciano ever fought. Rocky chopped him down like a stump. Rocky was short, so he didn't have much reach, not much footwork either, but he didn't need it. His hands did the job, like a hammer on a fence post. Clay had him on the run all night, the way he did Jersey Joe Walcott and Archie, Archie Moore. Marciano bled a little, Clay got lucky and knocked him down once, but Rocky got right back up and went at Clay like a freight train. I heard the punch when he hit Clay on the jaw with Susie Q. That's Susie Q, that's what he called his right hand, killer punch. And then he caught Clay with the left. Clay went to his knees, tried to pull himself up with the, with the ropes. TKO, baby! <laughs> the fight was filmed. Then Marciano died in a plane crash. So they only showed it one time at the drive-in. Rocky never got to see it, but he died knowing he was the greatest of all time. And you know what's really sweet? He was one of us, not from Texas, an Italian boy, but still red-blooded. And he wasn't out there mouthing off and talking bad about good white people. Some folks tried to make Clay out to be some kind of hero because he dodged a draft and didn't go to Vietnam. Damn coward, that's, that's what he was. They should have locked him up. Computer. Boom. Okay, I know I'm getting close to my time to contract, so do I have time for one more? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. I could go all night. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm going to read too and, and uh, let you get out of here. Um, and these are new poems. Um, the, um, the book, uh, my forthcoming uh, collection, is a poem. It was originally titled, you know, Our Shed Eyes, uh, New and Selected Poems on Race in America, and uh, some months ago I, I decided to uh, shift, focus a little bit, still about America, very much about race, uh, but uh, I wanted to include a number of poems commemorating the 40th uh, anniversary of the Atlantic Child Murders that uh, took place in about 1979 to 1981, 82. I know most of folks weren't even born then, but um, you should uh, 
we should learn uh, about this horrific ordeal about 40 black, poor black children who were murdered in Atlanta, Georgia, during this time. Uh, I'll spare the whole history, but uh, this, uh, this one poem uh, is, um, is a poem which the river talks to a young man who was eventually uh, arrested, and tried, convicted, in jail, he stayed in jail for 40 years. But only two of the murders, the other 28 cases, been closed. Then I saw Chattahoochee, it's called I Am Your Last Song, the Hoochie, a river of painted rocks. Was there nothing left to drink when you walked the wilderness, camouflaged, longing for fresh red water? Splash, splash, splash. Surely now, in your silent, solitary nights, you hear the echo and refrain splash, splash, splash. Starving yet familiar as bath or the breathless weight of glass dropped to stone. You, me, and our sweet demon, a cappella in the moonless night, renowned yet undiscovered, until finally like dawns soaring from a bell tower, heard. So the last poem of the evening um, <clears throat> is a poem for boys. It's called White Lightning. <coughs> White Lightning. Already tasting sugar rolling on my tongue and smelling fresh sliced salami, baked bread, and the dusty wood floor. I sprinted toward Rossetti's to buy jawbreakers with half of the two bits I had, until I saw the old black farmers, like bronze sculptures every Sunday morning, sitting on wooden benches beneath an overhang at the potato house. Feathered, wide brim hats spun light around their stiffly ironed shirts. Khakis and spit shine boots. Dazzled by the flare of men whose faith turns dirt to water, I lingered, wide eyed and agog, to hear truths and lies they told about hounds fish they caught in trouble in the white man's world. Some days, God and the devil laughed at the same time. The old men were just as eager to preach and give me a coin or two. Eventually, one of them pulled a bottle of white lightning from his boot. Without being told, I knew they were saying, it's time for the boy to move along. And so it's time for me to move along. Thank you all for being such a time. I've always loved to read and to write, and it's 
great man of American dignity, uh, but had really given any thought to who a poet is, was. I mean, I read some poetry by some black writers, but uh, and so that that's kind of where the journey began. I mean, I, there are points in which I got really serious about all of that, but I won't go into detail about the interest of time. But, uh, it's been quite a
And so many of our students today uh, in, in the post-secondary world, students in, in, from the classroom, were students who just um, didn't get the start that they should have gotten, that we should have given them from birth. They did not get the, the high, high quality care education. Uh, I mean, even today, there are thousands, literally thousands, of um, children who just don't have access to that. Don't have access to it. Um, and we're you know, working toward that. This past year, and uh, the last legis legislative session was the first year since Kathleen Blunt that we put new general fund dollars into uh, early care and education. Can you believe that? In all of the general years, we went the other direction. We took money away. And, well, that's another story. But, <laughs> but so I'd say, yeah, it, it has to start there. We've got to fix that. And if I can suggest anything to you out there, is be a strong advocate for that, for more money, more funding for uh, high quality uh, early care and education. And, and access to it. It's one thing to have the quality. When you've got poor children, economically disadvantaged children, and children with disabilities, who just, uh, when I say children, it's the parents of those children who can't afford it. Uh, it's so very expensive, uh, particularly for those birth to three-year-old children. But without that, you know, we're going to continue to have broken uh, men, broken students, until we, until we fix the beginning. Yes. You asked for it, I gave it to you. <laughs> I didn't mean to preach, but uh, any others? Come on. One more. Oh. All right, from Crown. All right. I was waiting for at least one of y'all. Wow. So, what does it mean to you to be Louisiana's fourth guard? Oh, man. Uh, man, that's. First time that question was asked. So, yeah, yeah, I can mean, think that it, but what does it mean to me? Yes. And, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, um, well, you know, first of all, I didn't, something I wouldn't have thought of. I, I knew it would have been a year ago. And I don't know, somewhere in the last, I don't know, when the process started in January, maybe of this year. The thought just kind of came out of nowhere. I, I, to be honest with you, I mean, it's just not something you wake up every day. Oh, I'm going to be a poor laureate one day. You know, it's, you know and it, it just and, and 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 but it was a thought, and I said, "Well, wait a minute, why not?" You know, because it, it seemed far fetched and it seemed way, I mean, unreachable. But then I said, "Well, well why not, me?" Hmm? And uh, I'm damn good. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't that vain, really. but no. It, so, it, so now that I'm I'm here, you know, it's what's really special. What's your name? Devante. Devante. What's really special for me is that I'm like you. I'm a black man. You know, that's what's really special. And since 1942, they had never been one of us standing here in this role. And so, uh, you know, I, that's what's really special for me. Now, not that I mean, every other poet who has, was named Lloyd was certainly deserving. There were two African-American women in that role. But, but I think it's important that, you know, uh, for especially being in the South and being a child, a native of the South, Having grown up uh, uh, partly, you know, through uh, the, the whole Jim Crow era of, of uh, segregation and integration, and having, you know, really felt the, the fire of, uh, of hate and racism right there at my door, in my face, as a child, and even later in life, it's. To be the poor lawyer of Louisiana, if it were if it were poor lawyer, some northern state, I don't know, I think, think different about it. But 
Louisiana that's special. Yes. And I think for you, I would want you to be able to say, to feel that same way, to feel, to feel that same pride. Um, if you know, and I know you do, of the challenges that young black men face growing up in the South, still today in this country. Um, that's, what's, that's, that's the most special feeling I have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So John wanted me to let all of us know that uh, all the proceeds from tonight's book sales will be donated to the Crown Program. Thank you, John. In the same spirit of thanks, thank you, President Dr. J. Kuhn and Provost Sue Westbrook for your continued support for this crown program. <laughs> Dr. Valerie Francis, thank you for sharing your wonderful gift with us. <laughs> and the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities for investing in cultural engagement across our state. We can put our hands together for the whole year. And once again, to John Warner Smith for your commitment to excellence in your craft. Your voice inspires us. And so at this time, I would like for everyone in Crown to, to stand and we'll, we'll end before we go and enjoy. All of us, we can go and enjoy and talk uh, to John, talk amongst ourselves. Don't leave because we, uh, Sodexo has uh, food outside and some water and some lemonade. So at this time, uh, I'd like for the Crown mentors and mentees, if you could stand and share the model that they created about a year and a half, almost a year and a half ago about what Crown stands for. Okay, so we'll start. We'll start in this brotherhood. Every king is a crown. In this brotherhood. Every king has his own king. In this brotherhood. Every king has his own dream. In this brotherhood. A king can't be a king without strength of his own brothers. Thank you, John. It made me think that he was he was bearing his soul, not just in the words that he was saying, but it was almost an indicator that he's probably seen some births. That's what I thought. And then the other thing was, in a way, I kind of assumed, you know, I'm gonna hear I'm gonna hear poetry about something that I don't understand. Maybe something that. It's a different experience that, that I'm used to because we come from different backgrounds. But I felt like the things that he talked about, his poetry, I feel like I, I've lived the very similar things. You know, we're not that far away in, in age, and so a lot of it rang true to me. And so I was almost surprised by how familiar the, the poetry seemed to me. I think what got me tonight is the the recognition of a sort of very old old 
practice of the sharing of poetry, of a poet, a seer, someone with the weight of history and the power of narrative with them, just taking a moment and saying to uh, a group of people, look, and it could be something as simple as looking at, looking at this ground that we're walking on, or look at this moment in history, or look at this old Ali fight, and being able to make sense of how that fits, uh, not only in, the, in, a, in a specialized experience of his own mind and his own engagement with the world, but also to encourage us to have our own uh, and to see the world through his eyes in that moment. On behalf of Crown, we thank you for your kind donations. Thank you, Dr. Smith.